So today I'm going to talk to you about revealing unconventional electronic structure using multi-edge X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So currently, uh, I, as Jerry said, I'm at Los Alamos National Lab where we're working towards the ability to perform in-situ molten salt XAS measurements on lanthanides and actinides. Uh, this work has really been uh, pioneered by Molly McInnes, and what we're looking at is the interaction of these lanthanide and actinide chlorides with outer sphere cations and how that can start to change or affect their uh, oxidation state or the ability to do electron transfer. This is really Molly's work. Uh, she's pioneered it. Uh, we are just uh, working towards this kind of cool and unique uh, capability where we can do uh, these molten salt experiments in situ. So here we are at SSRL with our custom molten salt furnace, and we're attempting to make these measurements uh, in real time. So I won't be focusing on that uh, today, but I just wanted to highlight that kind of cool capability that we're working towards here at Los Alamos. What I will be focusing on today is how I got my start doing X-ray spectroscopy, and that was at Cornell focusing on high valent first row transition metals. So I've shown here three uh, formerly high valent species, two copper three complexes and one nickel four complex. This copper three complex, uh, this copper tetricus CF3 is inert and colorless, which might not be what you would expect for a formerly a D8 uh, copper three uh, species. This uh, second copper three complex we'll focus on is uh, competent for nitrine transfer. And then this high valent nickel four complex is competent for reductive elimination. And what I'm hoping to show you throughout this talk is that we can start to explain these uh, types of uh, reactivity or lack of reactivity by looking at an inverted ligand field or invoking an inverted ligand field. So if you're not familiar with an inverted ligand field, when we think about a classic uh, Werner ligand field diagram, our ligand atomic orbitals are placed at lower energy, metal atomic orbitals at higher energy, and then when they mix, we're left with molecular orbitals that are largely metal in character. If we start to move away from this classical picture toward ligand field inversion, we simply invert the orderings of our metal atomic orbitals and ligand atomic orbitals, placing the metal atomic orbitals at lower energy, ligand atomic orbitals at higher energy. Now when they mix, we're left with molecular orbitals that are largely ligand in character. So you can think about oxidizing or reducing your species. If you are in fact in this regime of an inverted ligand field, you're really adding and removing those electrons to the ligand as opposed to the metal. So I want to kind of start off this story by focusing on this copper tetricus CF3 complex. And as we said, this is both inert and colorless. So here it is just stable on the bench top. You can see it's white. Uh, again, probably not what you would expect for a physically D8 uh, high valent species. We weren't the first uh, people to point out this kind of unique reactivity or stability. Back in 1995, Snyder said, uh, maybe this species is better described as D10 or copper one, as it is non-reactive to nucleophiles and electrophiles, colorless and bench stable. And if you run a fairly simple TDDF or a fairly simple DFT calculation on this complex and look at this computationally generated molecular orbital diagram, you see that it does suggest this compound has an inverted ligand field, where you find your metal orbitals uh, pulled down to lower energy and filled, and your LUMO only has about 32% copper 3D character. So the question becomes, is it really valid to refer to this complex as physically D8 if we're only missing about 60% of an electron? So we wanted to be able to investigate this more thoroughly uh, experimentally. And while I was at Cornell, I had the privilege of focusing my studies on X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So for this talk, I'll mainly be focusing on metal L-edge XAS, and that is just affecting the transition from the metal 2P up into a, uh, a 3D containing orbital, ligand orbital, or out into the continuum. And this is a really useful uh, technique if we're interested in probing the amount of D character in those acceptor orbitals, because there's a direct relationship uh, between the uh, amount of area under your L3 and 2 main lines and the amount of 3D character in those acceptor orbitals. And that is through this uh, covalency uh, equation shown here. So Ed Solomon's group established this back in 1993, where they looked at two different copper tetrachloride species, one in the D2D geometry and one in the D4H geometry. And as you change that geometry, you start to change the orbital mixing, which causes a different amount of 3D character in those acceptor orbitals and results in a different total L-edge intensity. 
So you can see you're losing intensity as you move from the D2D down to the D4H, and they were able to correlate that with the experimental copper 3D character as verified by other, some other means, in this case, EPR. So we wanted to set out to perform uh, these same types of LEDGE experiments. And in order to do that, we have the privilege of working with a really talented uh, group of um, uh, scientists at SSRL. So a staff scientist, uh, a postdoc, and a really talented graduate student on Beamline 10.1 using their transition edge sensor. So this is just a picture of Beamline 10.1. And here is the transition edge sensor. Uh, it's this large silver cylinder here at the end. And it's basically just a 240 pixel array of microcalorimeters where each pixel is a molybdenum copper sensor. So this whole detector is cooled down to about 100 millikelvin. And then as you excite your sample and photons are deposited uh, onto those pixels, they cause a very small temperature increase followed by a change in resistance. And that change in resistance is proportional to the photon energy. So uh, this uh, detector became really important to us for a couple different reasons. Uh, previous to being able to work with this transition edge sensor, we were typically performing our uh, sample collection in electron yield. Uh, as most of you are probably familiar with, the escape de depth of your electrons in electron yield is only about 10 nan nan nanometers. And we were looking at these high valent nickel four or copper three complexes and what was happening is we were seeing this really significant photo damage. So here we're really just looking at the surface and we can see the surface photo damage is very apparent. So what I've shown is just uh, six scans on the same uh, spot. So no rastering, just hitting the same spot over and over again. And you can see as you look at this nickel L edge and you move from the uh, first scan in black to the last scan in gray, that you see this really apparent photo damage. Additionally, we think we're getting some sample charging, uh, which is affecting our ability to uh, average and background, um, background subtract and normalize these scans. If we then move to using this transition edge sensor, we're now able to collect in partial fluorescence yield, giving us a, uh, um, an escape depth of, for our photons of about uh, 100 nanometers. And you can see this is the exact same uh, sample. Again, not rastering at all, just using a different uh, collection mode. And our photo damage is wildly attenuated. So you can see here scan one in black and here scan six in gray. And we really don't see that same level of photo damage. Of course, when we're actually performing these measurements, we are rastering. So we're only ever taking one scan on each point. Additionally, you don't see that, uh, that really significant background shift. Uh, so it gives us a much easier um, uh, data set to um, average and normalize. So now that we had this uh, technique and this ability in hand, we set out to basically redo what Ed Solomon had done, creating a correlation curve or a, a standard correlation curve, where we again looked at those two copper uh, tetra, um, tetrachloride species, one in the D2G, and one in the D4H geometry. And then we added one additional uh, compound, this copper tetraamine species. So here I've shown the alleges for these three standards. And you can see as we move through the series, we do see a change in that total alleg intensity. Just as Ed Solomon did, we can correlate that total alleg intensity back to the experimental percent copper 3D character, giving us this nice correlation between total alleg area and uh, experimental uh, percent D character. So there's been some contention in the literature as to whether it's valid to use just these L23 main lines um, to give a good measure of the uh, 3D character in those acceptor orbitals. And we wanted to probe that a little bit deeper. So we started with just a purely computational approach. So what I've shown here is just a uh, TUDFT generated uh, copper L edge for that copper tetrachus CF3 complex. And I've done three different computations. So in black, you'll see that excitation where I've allowed the full active space uh, of acceptor orbitals. In red, you can see I've limited that acceptor space to, or that active space to only the LUMO. And in gray, I have excluded the LUMO and only allowed excitation into uh, orbitals past the LUMO. So you can see from looking at this, that when we allow excitation into, the, into only the LUMO, we uh, fairly well reproduce that uh, L3 and L2 mainline. Whereas when we exclude the LUMO, we only see uh, intensity uh, in these satellite features here. We also wanted to kind of ex uh, experimentally probe this as well. So we turned to a two photon technique known as RICS or resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, where you first affect, uh, you first perform a high energy excitation, such as a K edge, uh, exciting a 1s electron, 
uh, up into a D uh, uh, an orbital containing D character. And then you uh, uh, um, allow a mission where that 2P electron falls down and fills that uh, 1S uh, hole, giving you a final configuration of 1S2, 2P5, 3D, and plus one. And you can see that if we take our incident energy here and we subtract our emission energy here, we're left with an energy transfer axis that probes the L edge indirectly. So what I've shown here in black is the directly measured L edge. And then I've shown three different incident energy slices. And you can see that when we're at an incident energy of 8982 EV, we most closely reproduce that L2 and 3 main line. So we turn back to computations to get a better understanding of what that uh, incident slice at 8982 was, uh, was giving us. And you can see here that if you look at the K edge for this copper tetrachus CF3 complex, that excitation at 8982 is in fact into the LUMO containing 30% copper character. And we'll use this ability um, to combine experiment and computation throughout the remainder of the talk as it lets us, uh, it helps us deconvolute our experimental analysis and uh, helps us validate our um, results in two different ways. So now that we're pretty confident that we can use our L23 uh, mainline to give us a good measure of the D orbital covalency in those acceptor orbitals, we turn to survey a library of copper species. So again, we started with our good friend, the copper tetrachus CF3 complex shown here, as well as some other high valent uh, trifluoromethyl containing uh, complexes as well. We also looked at a series of uh, copper 2, 3 halogenated species. And these are really nice because we're getting this direct oxidation where we're not uh, uh, affecting a large change on the ligand environment or geometry. So we can really see how that uh, oxidation is affecting the d orbital character without having to look at um, too many external factors. We also looked at a copper one, copper two, copper three series in collaboration with the Betley lab. And I'll focus a little bit more on this copper three complex uh, later in the talk as it is competent for nitrine uh, transfer. And then finally, we looked at a series of four air stable nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen supported species shown here. So we took these complexes out to SSRL, we took the L edge on them, and then again, we used that correlation curve to uh, correlate the total L edge character back to the experimental percent 3D character. We also did that computational assessment where we uh, uh, computationally generated um, uh, molecular orbital diagrams here. And what I've shown is both the calculated percent copper 3D character in black and the experimental percent copper 3D character in blue. And to really just jump to the punchline here, what we find is that all of the copper 3 species that we investigated have frontier orbitals with less than 50% copper character, both experimentally and computationally. And what this allowed, uh, what this correlation between calculated and experimental uh, really did for us was twofold. So on one hand, it uh, helped us validate both our experimental and computational results. And on the other hand, it now gives us a way to run a fairly quick calculation on a complex and correlate that back to the amount of experimental 3D character we would expect in that species as well. So that's exactly what we did. We turned to the literature and we investigated uh, nine additional species reported as early as 1955 and as recently as 2019. So again, now we can run a fairly quick calculation on these species, use our correlation curve, and correlate that back to the experimental percent 3D character that we would expect to find in those complexes. Eight out of these nine complexes also uh, present with less than 50% copper 3D character in their acceptor orbitals. The one, uh, I guess you could call exception, is uh, where we looked at copper in its most oxidized state in this uh, hexafluoride complex. And even then, where you would expect those fluoride ligands to be extremely oxidizing, we only find about 60% copper character in the average of the SOMO and the SOMO plus one. So we're still not quite looking like copper three, but more like copper two or even copper one. So what we really find is that physical copper three doesn't seem to exist in any of the systems considered here. Uh, it's not unique to that copper tetrachus CF3 complex, and it's not unique to the uh, selection of complexes that we decided to look at experimentally. It seems to be very prevalent in the literature as well. So with that, I'll pause for the first section and see if there's any questions. I guess I'm 
Jerry asked me to mo moderate. So, uh, Juan Lee, if you care to ask your questions about the parent photo reduction and the uh, partial fluorescence yield. Uh, right. So, sorry for us. I think I should not call it photo reduction, Kyle. Uh, to, uh -huh. It's overall a reduction process when the photons, soft X ray photons, heating the material. So, uh, if I look at your PFY, you have a previous slides to show the PFY has no uh, this kind of radiation reduction process. So it looks to me, uh, the spectral, if you scale the spectral, in general, your FY shows a higher oxidation state. That is very typical because <clears throat> on the surface of nickel, uh, it typically shows more nickel two plus in almost all nickel type of compounds. So that's why your TFY and TEY, they look generally different. Uh, but what I'm saying is if you scale your PFY spectra, the panel on the right, you will still see a pretty clear signature of the reduction process uh, upon radiation damage. So in, in that, I'm not questioning any of your results, especially I think your first uh, spectra, it looks pretty stable. It looks very much uh, high oxidation state of nickel. I'm just saying uh, for us, it is hard for me to understand why a soft X-ray FY gives less radiation damage. We always see they are the same. If we see it on TY, we always see it on FY. And two is, uh, looking at this group of spectra, it looks to me the, the radiation damage is still clearly there uh, in the FY spectra if you if you normalize it. But again, uh, thanks a lot. The very interesting topic, and I'm not questioning any of your results. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Was Ida? Were you going to weigh in on? Um, so yeah, on, but... so we had talked about um, uh, the heating being a problem as some of these complexes do uh, uh, perform reductive elimination when heated gently. So even uh, I believe at 55 degrees C over the course of two hours, they'll uh, reductively eliminate. So we did think about um, um, the, the heating being an issue. Um, we also, the TES um, detector gives us the ability to lower our flux quite a bit. So we were hopeful that the lowering of the total flux would also help attenuate that uh, uh, photo damage. So that's one other difference between the, the electron yield and the, the fluorescence yield shown here. All right, so Jerry has, well, there's two questions. So this is a ligand-based oxidation because of the low-lying D-manifold. Uh, in the copper species? Yeah, so we would argue that the, the, um, the metal D orbitals are pulled down to lower energy, right? So. So you're really performing that oxidation on ligand-centered orbitals. And then Jerry, um, if the goal is only partial fluorescence yield, does the transition edge sensor uh, have advantage over SDD? And actually, if you could, I, I, I actually don't know what SDD is because I'm not really a gear like Silicon drift diode. Oh, yeah, just yeah, yeah. A, sure. a vortex or something like that. Oh. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question just because I don't know enough about a uh, silicon silicon drift diode. Is that? Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to look at. I mean, I think the major advantage is the lack of background before and after the 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 edge. Yeah. Um, well, an SDD will probably have about a 50 volt resolution down at these energies. So the question is, do you need better than 50 volt resolution for rejection? I see. Of other fluorescences. Mm -hmm. 
haven't done the haven't done the Pepsi challenge to c compare the spectrum. Yeah. All right. I guess you should continue. Sorry. No, thank you. One more question. Have you considered any possible polarization, say an initial guess with copper two? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Have you considered any possible polarizations, say an initial guess with copper two? Uh, like, uh, like, do you have a polarization studies or? I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, do you want to I, yeah. So you? I'm just wondering, have you tried any possible uh, initial guesses? It, in my case, you show that it's likely to be a, um, or do you have any experimental evidence showing they have no unpaired electrons? Or what happens if you um, do, do some fragment calculations, putting a copper two in the center and a Oh. go on the ligands and see if they relax to the same electronic structure you you have yeah i haven't run those types of calculations but those would be really interesting to do yeah all right i think we'll march on okay so uh, at this point we had completed this study with copper and we were able to again generalize um, uh, this idea of a ligand field inversion to a large suite of copper complexes. So we wanted to move down along the first row transition metals and investigate nickel. So we set out to do a similar study on nickel, uh, formerly nickel four complexes. Again, looking at two nickel standards. So here we have this nickel tetrachloride complex and this nickel bis MNT species. And then a suite of uh, uh, what we will call for the purpose of this talk, low valent uh, uh, fluorinated species. So here we have a, a nickel two uh, series. Additional uh, nickel four complexes competent for CH activation and CC bond formation. And then just three additional uh, nickel four and uh, nickel three complexes as well. So before I kind of uh, go through the the higher level analysis that we performed on these complexes. I just want to take a minute and spend the next two slides um, on a more technical aspect of this study that might be more applicable to those of you who are doing these low energy X-ray studies. And that is the phenomenon of saturation. So uh, there's two um, uh, distortions to point out here. One is self-absorption, which occurs when emitted photons are resonantly reabsorbed. That's very different than saturation, which is what I'm going to highlight here, which occurs through absorption of exciting photons on their way into the sample. So in self-absorption, you're attenuating your signal by reabsorbing those emitted photons. And in saturation, you're attenuating your signal uh, by absorbing those exciting photons on their way in. So if we think about uh, our partial fluorescence yield, we can uh, use a uh, fairly generalized or uh, simplified equation that relates the total absorption cross-section of our element of interest, the total absorption cross-section of all of our background elements, and the total absorption cross-section of our emitted photons. And in order for the absorption cross-section of our element of interest to scale proportionally with our partial fluorescence yield, we need this denominator to remain constant. And that's only satisfied if the absorption cross-section of our element of interest remains much, much smaller than that of our background and of our emitted photons. So you can imagine as you're moving across this nickel L edge and you hit this L uh, main line, if the absorption cross-section of our nickel starts to become too large or larger than our background and our emitted photons, now our denominator changes and we start to attenuate our signal uh, at the most um, intense portions of our spectrum. So we can visualize this by looking not at the nickel emission, but by looking at the emission of an observer element. So in this case, we're looking at this nickel tetricus CF3 complex, and we can use fluorine as our observer element. You don't have to use fluorine. You can use uh, oxygen or um, uh, chlorine or things like that. But in this case, we'll be looking at fluorine. So the only difference between the, uh, the spectrum on the left and the spectrum on the right is that on the left, we're looking at the nickel emission channel, and on the right, we're looking at the fluorine emission channel. And you can see as we move across that nickel edge, we get dips in our spectrum as we approach the L3 and L2 main lines. 
So this inverse partial fluorescence yield, as we'll call it, not only shows us that there is distortion or saturation happening in our samples, but it also gives us a way to correct for that saturation. So if we rewrite this equation for inverse partial fluorescence yield, now we have the total absorption cross-section of our observer element as opposed to the total absorption cross-section of our element of interest. And you can see what we're after is this uh, absorption cross-section of the element of interest. And we can achieve that by simply taking our partial fluorescence yield here and dividing by our inverse partial fluorescence yield here. So that's exactly what we've done for our uh, uh, nickel, our suite of nickel complexes. And that's what I've shown here. So once you perform that, uh, uh, that division or that correction, you end up with this unsaturated or corrected spectrum shown in black. And you can see that we do gain quite a bit of intensity from our uh, saturated spectrum shown in red. So we went ahead and did this for our two uh, standard complexes, that nickel bis MNT species and that nickel tetrachloride species. And you can see that we do have uh, both an uh, improvement in our y-intercept, which should uh, be zero, as well as a slight improvement in our R squared. So for the remainder of the, uh, the nickel portion of this talk, I'll simply be using the corrected or unsaturated uh, spectrum and L edge areas. So now that we uh, uh, established a way to deal with this uh, saturation, we turned back to this suite of nickel complexes and moved ahead along uh, as we had with the copper system. And again, what we find here looking at these nickel-4 complexes is that physical D6 nickel-4 doesn't seem to exist in any of the systems studied. So the only difference here between the nickel and the copper is that now we're looking at a LUMO and a LUMO plus 1. And you can see that our percent nickel 3D character is uh, at a low around 25%, and then at a high in the nickel-4 species, somewhere between 45 and 50%. And even the nickel three complex here only presents with about 56 to 60% nickel three character in those acceptor orbitals. When we start to think about having to account for all of these, uh, uh, for additional orbitals and uh, do whole counting, it can be confusing or it can be um, uh, additional level of complication to have to account for that number of holes. So a really good way to think about uh, the oxidation state is just by converting this down to the D orbital vacancy. So that's what we've done here. You can see the nickel four complexes shown in red, uh, the nickel two complexes shown in blue, and that nickel three complex shown in gray. And our D orbital uh, vacancy is down around one or two for these species. So of course, for nickel four, we would expect a D orbital vacancy of four, and then moving on down the series to three, two, and one. So all of our complexes are looking a lot more like nickel one and nickel two than they are nickel three and nickel four. We again wanted to extend um, this study to species in the literature. And part of the reason for that is that all of these uh, nickel four complexes or the majority of these nickel four complexes that we looked at here all have these fluorinated uh, ligands. And we wanted to put our nickel in a less uh, less oxidizing environment and do a study on species that did not contain those fluorinated ligands. So again, we turn to the literature, and I know this is a lot of orbital plots on one slide, but what I just want to point out to you is that by quick glance, you can see all of this uh, orbital uh, or electron density on your ligand as opposed to your metal. There's a very small amount of that uh, uh, metal contribution to these orbitals. And again, uh, to avoid having to account for how many holes we have in these systems, we can just look at the nickel vacancy. So here we have a nickel 3D vacancy of 1.1 up to a nickel 3D vacancy of 1.8. So again, we're not really looking like nickel 3 or nickel 4, we're looking more like nickel 1 or nickel 2. We wanted to uh, take this to the extreme and again, put our nickel in a highly oxidizing environment. So we turned back uh, akin to the copper story to this uh, nickel hexafluoride species. And if you look here at your um, uh, computationally generated uh, molecular orbital diagram, where you would typically find your metal orbitals, we find only 57% uh, nickel 3D character in our unfilled EG set. And that gives us a uh, D vacancy of 2.5 or a D count of 7.5. If you look a little closer at this MO diagram, you'll find um, where we would normally find our conventional ligand um, um, molecular orbitals, we actually find a largely metal-based uh, nickel 3D orbital pulled down to lower energy here. 
So we are starting to approach that idea of ligand field inversion, where we're seeing those metal orbitals again pulled down to lower energy and our ligand orbitals um, uh, at higher energy. I'll pause again for questions. Well, I can try to ask one if my Wi-Fi doesn't glitch. Um, X-ray XES, uh, iron and nickel are listed that often they don't show sensitivity to sedation state, maybe especially the oxides. And so uh, that's been explained as, as sort of a charge transfer multiplet or shake kind of effect. And I'm wondering if uh, the inversion you're talking about um, could explain it also. Uh, I think I missed the very beginning of your uh, statement. So you're saying iron and nickel don't typically show sensitivity in the K shell, like the K beta for uh, nickel oxide or even K yeah. alpha for nickel oxide and iron oxides doesn't show a lot of sensitivity to oxidation state. And so if all of the change in oxidation state is actually on the ligand in those systems. Right. Then you wouldn't expect. You wouldn't expect it. And that's been explained as a charge transfer multiplet effect. And it doesn't feel like that's the same thing. This feels independent, am I right? Yeah, that would be a different, uh, a different type of, of phenomenon. Okay, all right. Uh, Yang Ha, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, so I, I realize here you simply use the covalency to define the redox state of your nickel, uh, just based on the area of your air edge spectra. So I will also correlate this with the shape or the energy shift of the edge. And yeah. does that make sense? So we have done uh, energy shift studies and we found that they're not as uh, diagnostic as we would hope uh, that they would be. Um, so you get a lot of changes in the energy shift based on geometry or, or ligand environment or things like that. Um, so we found that that's not always a reliable way to uh, correlate oxidation state. All right, seeing questions in the chat, you should continue. Okay. Uh, so through the first two sections of this talk, I've shown you uh, what these three copper or what these three high valent species have in common. So they all present with diminished d orbital character in their acceptor uh, orbitals or in their LUMO or average of LUMO and LUMO plus one. Now we're gonna talk about what they don't have in common and that is their reactivity. So this copper tetrachis CF3 complex, as we said, is fairly non-reactive, it's bench stable. In contrast, the copper three benzyl species and this nickel four phenyl species both undergo reductive elimination when heated gently to 55 degrees C over the course of two hours. So it doesn't seem like this uh, reactivity is coming from this highly oxidized uh, metal center since we're getting this contrast and reactivity here. We think we can explain this reactivity through a simple electrostatic argument. So in this copper tetrachis CF3 complex, all of your coordinated carbons are uh, slightly electrophilic. So there's no driving force for CC bond formation, at least electrostatically. However, if you look at this copper three benzyl and this nickel four phenyl, now in both cases, you have a coordinated carbon, which is nucleophilic. So now you have this electrostatic driving force for this reductive elimination. So we think what this shows us is that it's not an oxidized metal center that's driving the reactivity, but rather electron deficiency or charge at the ligand. So you might be able to see where this is going. We wanted to turn to an x-ray technique where we could probe the ligand directly, and that is ligand K-edge. So now here we're affecting an excitation out of a ligand S orbital, again, up into a pi star or into the continuum. And what we're looking for here is this pre-edge feature uh, down below, um, uh, uh, pulled away from your edge. In this case, we're looking at a nitrogen edge, so we're down uh, below 400. And just like we correlated the area of our L edges back to the amount of uh, metal 3D character in our acceptor orbitals, now we can correlate this area back to the amount of ligand uh, character in our acceptor orbitals. So this is done uh, pretty frequently with sulfur and chlorine, 
And we wanted to see if we could better understand where the oxidation in some of these copper complexes that I uh, talked about previously was happening. So we turned back to this nice uh, one electron oxidation that I, uh, I alluded to earlier, where we have a neutral species and then just the one electron oxidized species. We know from our copper L edges that we don't seem to be getting uh, oxidation centered on the copper, so where is it happening? If we start with the chlorine K edge shown here, now we're looking at this pre-edge feature down at around 28, 20 EV. And you can see that we do have a slight increase as we move from the neutral species shown in gray to the one electron oxidized species shown in red. But if you actually go ahead and account for the number of holes, one uh, in the neutral species and two in the one electron oxidized species, you see a decrease in the total amount of chlorine character. So it doesn't seem as though that oxidation is happening uh, in a chlorine centered orbital. If we then turn to sulfur, you can see pretty immediately that as we move from that one, uh, that neutral species to that one electron oxidized species, that we see a large increase in the intensity of that sulfur pre-edge feature. If you go ahead and count for, account for the number of holes here, we see we're moving from about 8% sulfur character to about 22% sulfur character in that one electron oxidized complex. This trends nicely with a computational assessment of this complex. Uh, on the left, I've shown the molecular orbital diagram for the neutral species. And again, we just have that SOMO uh, accounting for 52% uh, copper character, about 6% chlorine character, and 10% sulfur character, which agrees well with our uh, experimental results. And then if we look at the one electron oxidized complex, now we have a LUMO that only has 26% copper character, 6% sulfur character, or 6% chlorine character, and about 26% sulfur character. So there's two really interesting takeaways uh, for me in this, uh, in this assessment. And the first one is that the copper character doesn't seem to be changing at all. Over here, we have one hole in an orbital that's 52% copper. And over here, we have two holes in an orbital that's 26% copper character. The other interesting thing is that if you, uh, if you highlight the metal orbitals shown here in red, you can see that in the neutral species, they're really spread out uh, throughout this molecular orbital diagram. And then as we move to the one electron oxidized species, you see this uh, ligand field aversion kind of make itself visible where you have those copper orbitals pulled down to lower energy and our ligand orbitals uh, remaining here at higher energy. So again, the electron hole character at the copper center remains unchanged upon that one electron oxidation. So as I said, uh, the use of sulfur and chlorine uh, uh, K edges in the literature is pretty um, prevalent. You're up here at around an energy of 2500 EV. As you move down towards the lighter atoms such as nitrogen, now you're down at an energy of around 400 EV and it becomes a little bit more difficult to perform these experiments. So we set out to do a full calibration of nitrogen K edge and again, correlate the amount of area under that pre-edge feature back to the amount of nitrogen character in the acceptor orbitals, and then uh, create this same correlation between experimental percent nitrogen 2P character and calculated percent nitrogen 2P character. So I won't go into detail on this study, but we did perform a comprehensive uh, analysis of 16 nitrogen containing species using two different methods, one where we started with an experimental uh, standard and one where we started with a, a computational standard. And we were able to really uh, cleanly correlate that calculated percent nitrogen 2P character back to the experimental percent nitrogen 2P character. So now that we had that uh, nitrogen K edge correlation in hand, we wanted to really uh, combine all of these different types of um, X-ray uh, techniques, as well as our computation to see if we could uh, uh, um, uh, perform a full assessment on one of these um, high valent copper species and see if we could draw a correlation between the uh, X-ray data and uh, the reactivity of this complex. So again, we turn to this copper one, copper three, and or copper two, copper three series uh, that we worked with on the, uh, we worked with the Betley lab. And um, you can see from our, we already established from our uh, copper L edges that we're not seeing a large amount of copper oxidation as we move through this series. So here in green, I've shown the copper one L edge, and you can see we have very little uh, L edge intensity, which is to be expected for a formally and physically D10 species. Then as we move to the copper two species, we do see uh, copper oxidation, again, as to be expected, 
And then as we move to the copper three, we actually see diminished intensity in that copper three L edge. So we know that that oxidation is not happening at the copper center, and we wanted to understand where uh, in the molecule it was occurring. So we turned uh, to probe the uh, uh, charge or electron deficiency at the ligand. And again, we used nitrogen K edge. So here I've shown the nitrogen K edge of the copper one species in green. Again, you're looking for that low energy pre-edge feature. It's completely absent in this copper one, uh, in this copper one scan. But as we move to copper two, we start to see a little bit of ligand oxidation. And then as we move to the copper three complex, we see this very intense pre-edge feature. Another note about this pre-edge feature is this kind of unique splitting here. And we wanted to get a better understanding of uh, where this, uh, exactly where this oxidation was taking place and where that splitting was coming from. So we turned to a uh, Sorky calculation uh, where we um, uh, did a multi-configurational ground state study on this copper complex. And what you can find is that 60% of the ground state is predicted to be a copper one nitrine species where you have two unpaired electrons lying in orthogonal P orbitals. The second most prevalent um, uh, configuration accounts for 25% of that ground state where you have a copper two complex. Uh, what's interesting about this, um, this uh, the majority of this ground state is that the splitting between these to orbitals aligns very well with the splitting that we see here in this pre-edge feature. So we do believe that this uh, complex, the reason that this complex is competent for nitrine transfer is not because you have a highly oxidized copper center, but because you have a very angry uh, electron deficient nitrogen. Uh, the fact that those unpaired electrons lie in those orthogonal, uh, orthogonal uh, p orbitals also makes them accessible for substrate reaction, allowing uh, a species similar to this one to be competent for nitrine transfer. So with that, I just wanna kind of close here and say that hopefully I've shown you that physical copper D8 and nickel D6 do not seem to exist in the systems that we've studied. Additionally, ligand field inversion or high levels of covalency um, uh, between these metal and ligand species doesn't seem to be unique. And uh, it gives us a really good way to think about uh, uh, oxidation state and reactivity in some of these complexes. So this idea of ligand field inversion can explain why this complex is inert, but why these complexes are competent for reductive elimination or nitrine transfer. So with that, I would like to take thank my grad school group, uh, obviously Kyle for being such a wonderful mentor and Sam uh, for attending all of those uh, long beamline trips with me. And then my group at Atlanta uh, for kind of taking me under their wing, uh, especially Stash Cosmore. He uh, has been a really great mentor getting me started uh, doing X-ray spectroscopy on F elements and just the whole team as a whole for really just exceeding my expectations. And with that, I will take any final questions. Your measurements were mostly lower energy, the L edges on the transition metals, and then of course the the, the ligand K edges for the light elements. Yeah. What kind of signatures? What kind of signatures do you think you might see in the K shell spectroscopy for the transition metals that might give you a hint um, about this uh, orbital inversion? Um, so, like for K edges. Yeah. So we've done. Um, we typically also do metal K edges on all of those. Uh, transition metal species, but there's so much influence in the pre-edge features and the rising edge features from geometry and ligand environment that we have a hard time uh, teasing out oxidation state analyses there. Um, so we do look at them, but we don't really consider them signatures for oxidation state, similar to the energy shift in, in the L edge. Okay. Um, what do you think, do you think that you understand enough about the orbital inversion now that you can start making guesses about other systems that would have orbital inversion? So yeah. if I ask you titanium, tell me how I could find a titanium or a chromium complex that ought to have this inversion. How would you start thinking about that? Yeah, so that's kind of the, the end goal, right? To try to be able to predict reactivity, to say, oh, we want this species to be inverted. So let's, let's employ a trifluoromethyl group or let's let's employ a, a highly oxidizing ligand ligand environment or, or something like that. Um, uh, 
So we haven't done that yet, but we're we're kind of just starting to think about let's let's build a nickel complex that looks similar to this copper complex and run a calculation on it. And then that simple calculation, now that we've verified that computational and experimental uh, kind of agreement, uh, we could say, okay, that that looks inverted or that doesn't. You gave a perfect old school answer. I was wondering if you were going to give a data science answer. Answer. Let's go ahead and make a thousand good guesses, run them all through, and right. then see if we can train up a neural network to go hunting for orbital inversion. Yeah. Kyle, no, I mean, any that's, thoughts? That's one of the advantages with doing, with being able to do these fairly quick computations, right? You can just run, yeah. you can run a hundred computations and say, oh, this one's inverted. Well, I'm, well, I'm no, not just that, but you can, you can train, right? You can train a neural network on the results to go looking for um uh for new motifs um yeah. perhaps uh kyle go ahead i'm so sorry oh no it's that's all right i mean i didn't want to weigh in and steal out of thunder but you know since she's gone we've looked at early metals you know it, it, it the transition series is a continuum right the, as the z effective rises the d manifold descends and at a, at a certain point you're going to get to metal complexes where you know, the group electronegativity of the coordinated ligands is, is going to be, you know, two electron withdrawing uh, to, to you know, or, or rather is, is not going to be more electron withdrawing than the metal. And so it's going to cough up the, uh, the electrons to the ligands. And it seems to be, you know, by the time you get to something like iron, you know, iron four, formerly iron four, formerly iron five, you know, in, in famous compounds like compound one, ferial species, you know, those iron oxygen molecular orbitals are half iron, half oxygen. But if you get to the, the early metals, you know, it, it does look like the redox is as you would expect. Titanium 2 is a D2 species, right? Titanium 4 is a D0 species. It's only when you start to get to the late metals where this stuff starts to become ambiguous, right? You have some nickel 2 species that have inverted you know, uh, pop, uh, composition of the of the LUMO and some nickel two species that are flying, but but universally nickel four and copper three are going to have these inverted um, structures, right? If you can't get there with fluoride as your coordination shell, you're not going to get there, right? So I, I think you know, and I I am old school and I don't do the machine learning thing. This I prefer I prefer you know chemical intuition. Right. And so if you know now that copper three and nickel four are danger will Robinson, you know, it's you're not really oxidizing at the metal. The ligands are going to participate more in the chemistry. I find that, you know, sufficiently predictive and useful. OK, I'll ask a, a, a real physicist question now. Or Stosh, did you go ahead, Stosh, go. I'd love to ask a question. Um, as someone who's lost hundreds of hours searching for nitrogen KH signals. Uh, I was curious if you, you know, the, the, the data you presented was, was pretty noisy, but um, were you only able to make those measurements using that, that special calorimetry detector on, on, on whatever beam line that is 10 to or whatever it is? Yeah. Uh, or could, you, could you see total electron yield or was, was there an option? Did you need the sensitivity of that, that array that they have on that? that uh, chamber in order to be able to make these measurements. And if, if I was to go back, or the real reason I'm asking is if I were to go back and revisit some of our failed attempts to study actinite species with nit by nitrogen k edge, um, do we have a chance now? Yeah, so we were able to see it in electron yield, but we ran into so many problems with sample charging and background that we weren't able to get consistent or as consistent scans, right? Um, so I would say you do have a chance. Um, you could go and use the, the TES detector at 10.1, um, and the data is a little noisier, but if you, if you just collect more scans, obviously you can, you can kind of parse that out. 